Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. I'm chatting tonight to Datuk Satina Said Saleh, educationist and council member of the National Education Advisory Council. Um, now, just before the break, you touched on something really important, teacher quality and teacher welfare. You talked yes, about yeah. how the former education minister had done a lot in terms of improving uh, teacher welfare. I want you to elaborate a little bit on that because yes. I think that's really important, an important area of education reform which yes. is often not spoken about or given emphasis on teacher yes. professionalism teacher career opportunity advancement right. and welfare that's right um, one of the uh, initiatives that we're going to do based on all this information that we have collected uh, would be uh, uh, looking at teacher quality and teacher professionalism. We're not even using the word teacher. We're going to talk about educators. Okay, so we're, we're moving away from We are the moving teacher away from teachers to into educator yes, educators. Okay. Because uh, teachers, once upon a time, we used to, teachers used to be like, when I'm my time, we used to provide, give information to my students. Mm -hmm. You know, you seek information, then you teach them in the classroom. Right. It's gone already. It's like rote learning. Yes, right, okay. yeah. But nowadays, they can get the information at the it's, you know, at the tips of their fingers. They're so much smarter than yeah. we were. <laughs> so we need to sort of facilitate and educate them. Okay. How actually, for example, using information, in the, the best way of using information, okay. handling the information so that you will not be using the wrong information while you are learning and building yourself. So this changing role of mm. teachers or educators, right? It, it's no doubt it's changing. Right. Are our educators equipped for this, uh, for the changing role, is the ministry aware and right. doing things to, you know, to allow teachers to evolve in this role? That's right. The ministry is definitely very aware of that, mm. and it has been there for the last how many years. But the journey is very long, Melissa. You know, you can't transform the education system within a short time. Okay. So this is one of the reasons. Sometimes I got, I, I know, I felt very, very sad when people expect everything to be done within nine or uh, an, uh, one year, mm. twenty. It's not that uh, you know I'm blaming anybody, but I think we need to be, to have a little bit of patience. Uh, but while we are preparing teachers, while we are trying to uh, equip teachers to be able to play a role of facilitators and educators, the journey must continue. Can I just ask yeah. you why? does the journey take such a long time? What are some of the institutional challenges that right. cause this to take, that cause educational reform to take such a long time, long, time. long process? Why is it? So one of the things actually is mindset. Mindset? Mindset and comfort zone. Of? Because comfort zone of not only teachers, uh -huh. but also at the same time the institution, the people around that as well, you know? Uh, I think just, just for example, if we are very happy with certain things that we do, even personally, mm -hmm. we are doing it the same way and we are getting results, but we are not looking at what, what's happening outside the world, you know, what's coming. Mm. So uh, that is quite a challenge because we also have teachers, some of the teachers, who are a bit, you know, they are not really open. Right. Put this new development. Well, they've education. been doing things a, a certain way yes. for a long time. long time. So change is always uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, yes. Okay, a and as um, an advisor mm. <laughs> to the <laughs> minister and the yes. ministry, yes. what would your advice be to change the mindset, to speed yes. the process along? I think uh, one thing that we have to do, uh, I, I, you know, you can see, Melissa, we all already passed our time. Actually, we are no longer, we don't have any more sort of ambition or something we want to achieve. But we do in the council, most of us, we have retired, most of us. So the only thing that we want to do actually is to see the system is going to be transformed. Mm. The children will get better education. Okay. Teachers will be uh, more exposed to new way of uh, educating our children. So these are the things that we are trying to do. So I think we need to, actually many of us, we go to school. Right. Actually, we talk to teachers. Okay, so you have on the ground exposure. Yes. You talk to the, to yes, the teachers who yes. are teaching classrooms yes. right now. We okay. have education with them. Right. So it is sort of a motivation as well so that they will be aware if you are not willing to change, if you want to be totally comfortable, you will be obsolete. Okay. You will, will be of no use, you know. Mm. I, I even give that example. I have to learn a lot of new things, right. despite of, you know, we are not young anymore, you know, but we need to, we need to do a lot of things, you so, see. So that's a qu another question, right? Is the fear of change coming from 
the fear of being ill-equipped, a lack of skill to right. to yes. adopt to these uh, to adapt to these new challenges. That's right. Or is it a certain dependency mm -mm. on receiving instruction from the ministry? So that hampers the way they want to teach, perhaps more creatively. That's right. Yes, both. A ways. bit of both. Ah, okay. yes, a bit of okay. both. I would say one. I think in town, in the rural area, urban area, it is a lot, a lot easier to to get teachers to learn new things. Sure. Okay. But for teachers in the rural areas, it, there are limit, very limited resources that we have. Mm. And the last few years has been quite difficult in terms of uh, budget as well. Okay. But uh, notwithstanding that, we are also playing quite a... Uh, uh, and I'm one of them actually, together with my team, we are uh, very much championing the public-private private partnership. Are there, are there yeah. dangers to allowing the private sector into our schools? No, okay. not personally because we have experienced it. Actually, I'm, because I feel the private sectors, they will be able to come in actually not only support in terms of financial, but they also have the knowledge. Okay, can you elaborate a little bit when yes. you talk about private public, public partnerships? Public, yes. What do you mean by that specifically to the education sector? Okay. Do you, you still remember, Melissa, about the Trust School Program? Yes. The Trust School Program, actually, during that time, I was still the education advisor to Kazana. Okay. Yeah, so we started in 20110. Initially, they had only 10 schools, five, mm -hmm. in, uh, five in Joho, five in Sarawak. They had people to fund. It wasn't cheap. It, was, it cost millions, you know, mm -hmm. to transform the whole school, the ecosystem of the school. But the problem that they, the challenges they had during that time, teachers not willing to, to be part of it. Okay. Some of them, not all of them. But at the end of it, after two months, they were just like there for you because they feel, oh, I'm learning new things. I'm telling my children are very happy. My children are coming to school without me lecturing them tomorrow, please finish your homework or whatever it is. So these are actually, it's already proven. So, so private sort of sector comes in with the financial, financial resources yes. and takes away that burden from the education ministry? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They okay. just do the topping up. Okay. They don't give cash to the school, they don't give money, but they upskill teachers. Okay. They do capacity buildings. All right. No? So why is there such a hesitation to adopt a private-public partnership for uh, the education system? There is not Now I think things have changed quite a bit, but I think the only thing that I have uh, mentioned uh, many times that I've mentioned to even to the uh, Minister of Education as well. I personally, actually, because he told me, Satina, that to Satina, you are going to ch uh, champion this. So I'm passionate because I think after nine years now, I've been outside, so I do know how the private sectors are mm. working. I could see that they are very genuine people. Mm. They are the people who, who are willing to give a lot for the sake of the children. Right. It is not about them anymore. It is about building up the Is school. this part of their CSR? Yes, okay. CSR. So, so there's yeah. real opportunity to tap the pu yes, private sector yes, for yeah. the benefit of our That's children. Right. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, but the ministry need to structure them properly. Okay. You need to have a proper way of addressing them so that they would be able to come easily. I think sometimes they have issues with Officers. This Bureaucr is the mindset again. Bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Okay. Yes, so bureaucracy yeah. has become a stumbling block, a stumbling block for certain. the private sector to want to participate That's right. in the education sector. I think we must always remember uh, now, education is not the sole, the government is not the sole owner of education. It is a sharing thing. Everybody wants to have a share in educating their children. So you can't say that Ministry of Education is the best in delivering education. No, not anymore. I love that. So education is not the sole, uh, the government is not the sole owner, owner. of yes. education. Educa yes. All right, we're going to be back <laughs> in just a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us right here on Consider This.